But we're here to talk about uh, media and entertainment and games and digital life and all of the ways that it's, it's changing. It's a sector that's completely in flux, yet we need it more than ever. The challenge is to continue to be creative, yet be completely nimble, to be an artist and a true believer and think like a marketer and make sure that both you and your shareholders and stakeholders are happy and making money. Um, and how do you get your next job or your dream job? This, uh, can you invent it? And how do you say, how do you manage other people like yourself? So these are the big issues that have come up in my reporting over the years. And I can't think of a better group of people to sort of to start unpacking that. Yomi, I'm going to start with you. Your 16 years at MTV, you're now a, a VP, started as an intern. I assure you that never happens <laughs> anymore. It's extraordinary. So. Uh, maybe you could spend a few minutes walking us through your illustrious career, and um, I, I, I nicknamed you the trend detector, because yeah. I feel like anybody who could stay at such a cutting edge, um, intersectional brand for that long must be a miracle man. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, first of all, hi, Dr. B. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think for me, it really started with my internship. Um, I did my undergrad at Temple University. It was actually a civil engineering major. Um, and once I got into the music industry, I think that the one prerequisite that was required was, was passion. And I think everything else sort of filled itself in. Um, I think that that's the, the basis of, of what we do and, and how we look at things. And, and I think it is sort of spotting trends. I mean, you know, Ellen, you, you talked about it briefly, but the, the, the changes of te in technology have changed what we do as a, as a business. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, and on the flip side, the record labels as well. I think it's all been dictated by the youth. It's a youth-generated culture. MTV is a youth brand. Um, and that's part of the reason why I have to tell people when I go to Whole Foods or Trader Joe's why we don't play music videos as much is because, well, the, the dynamics have changed. You know, there's a lot more options for, for, for millennials to watch music videos and to watch content. There's your phone, there's your laptop, and then there's television. And so we're, we're, we're just a part of the puzzle right now. So our strategy moving forward is really to kind of adapt to the climate. It's not to necessarily put something in place and to say this is what people are going to run to because we know that we're not the only gig in town. So we're constantly monitoring the trends that are happening, trying to figure out how we can be a part of that space. And part of the strategy is also to kind of play in other spaces that we haven't played played in before you know before it was just us and nobody else but now you've got linear competitors like vice who just got 80 million plus homes with vice land you've got revolt and puff daddy doing his thing over there and then you've got spotify and apple um, and they're looking for a content place now too so and then you've got social media i mean snapchat discoveries like what the kids are watching today. So it's like, all right, how do we get into that space? Thankfully, we do have a Snapchat channel if you want to follow us. Um, so we need to get into the spaces where our audience is living, and that's sort of like the strategy moving forward, and that can pivot at any moment. So we're constantly in beta mode. Okay. Shruti? So I, I just finished a big deadline, so I'm in that I haven't slept much for the last five days, and then I got on the phone with Shruti this morning, and it was like this jolt of joy and caffeine the stories that she can tell, and we hope that we can get her to tease them out, some of them out today. As a producer and director, um, as a person who understands branded content and what big brands actually need, it's been an, you've had an extraordinary career, both making art and commerce and having it seamlessly work together. Could you talk a little bit about what you do, how you do it, and drop as many famous names as you'd like? <laughs> I wonder if my parents can actually even say what I do. They're a little confused. But I'm a filmmaker, and I direct and produce, but I've been on the commissioning side of content as well, working for different media companies, including MTV, having tried to find new voices and filmmakers and writers and artists to harness some of their ideas and cr allow them to craft it with the platform and strategy in mind. And then I also worked at Condé Nast, focusing on the content for Vogue, and then went to Nylon, as their VP of TV and video, and having worked on the commissioning side of media companies, after a while it was time to start my own production company, which I started with a former colleague of mine from MTV who came from the television side, and another a friend of ours who we had worked with, Ross Kaufman, who came from the documentary side, and Ross, it does help when you have an Oscar and Emmy winning 
partner. Um, and he, he directed Born Into Brothels, which won Best Documentary about a decade ago, and then E-Team, which is on Netflix. And so for us, we come at storytelling in so many different ways and formats from long form. And for several years, I've worked with James Franco on scripted narrative films and have worked with various actors on movies from Jessica Chastain, Mila Kunis, Keanu Reeves, uh, Zach Braff, Whoopi Goldberg, Olivia Wilde, a few people. And so it's been a real joy to work with um, Hollywood talent on independent and new voice uh, and talent with new filmmakers, first time filmmakers. And I went to, uh, when I moved to the States, I'm also from India by way of the Middle East. And when I moved to the States for undergrad um, about, oh gosh, like 16 years ago, I, stu I studied art and economics, and then many years later found myself doing an MBA at Stern and my MFA in film at Tisch. So I still haven't made up my mind between art and commerce. Instead, I got an accelerated degree in indecision, I guess. But so I really love working on projects that have special voices with special people that challenge me, that challenge us as a team. And at our company, we're crafting scripted films, TV series, and we're represented by CAA. And there's a lot of stuff that we've already, even as a young company, what's exciting is to be able to build a business, which is new, because then you suddenly have an, the hat of an entrepreneur, which is terrifying as well. And we're, we're lucky that our clients now include Apple and ESPN, IMG, PepsiCo. But the type of stuff that we're doing for them is to also really understand the new ways of crafting content in an inventive way, because there's a lot of content. So how do you make that stand out, especially for brands that have been around for a while, which is a challenge that we also ask ourselves as filmmakers. So it's constantly in flux. I feel like we're in beta and we're still in alpha. So, so um, when I first met Susanna, I, I um, complimented her. I go to a lot of conferences, as we all do. And Games for Change, where she is now at the helm, is absolutely my favorite every year. It is that wonderful mix of, of real optimi delusional optimism with, with digital tools that are still being invented that can make an impact. It's sort of like the perfect triple whammy. Maybe you could um, walk, but your, your resume is extraordinarily packed with different experiences. And um, it sort of seems to me it's the perfect way to talk about how um, there is no blueprint or direct path for an, an entertainment or media career. There probably never was, but there definitely isn't today. It wasn't planned. It wasn't intended. I don't know if anyone really intends to reinvent themselves. Um, but uh, it started off with a, um, you know, with the degree that I had in college was theater. I came to New York to pursue the performing arts. And that was a, um, a career that lasted, you know, I, I gave it a good go for about five years. You know, I waited on lots of tables and I, I did what a lot of um, actors, struggling performers and actors do. Um, but along the way, I stumbled into film and I realized that I enjoyed other forms of storytelling as much as I did um, uh, being on the stage. And in, the, in the, the world of filmmaking, actually I worked for um, the Independent Feature Project okay. early in my career in Good Machine before yeah before they, yeah, Ted and, and James, yep. Um, uh, and uh, did that for a few years, and I, I realized that there was a lot, as, as much creativity going on behind the camera and in the, in the business and the development parts of the, of the industry as there was as a performer. And I realized that, uh, personally, I had a lot of the skill sets that was able to bridge those two worlds. Um, and I, found, I find myself, when I, when I think about my career, I don't think myself as a business person or as a salesperson. It's a creative partnerships. I mean, that's how I, I view the world and I, and I see how my career has, has uh, evolved. Um, after working in film for a couple of years, I, um, I decided I want a different kind of stability because there isn't a lot of stability, at least there wasn't back then in independent film. Um, I ended up working with the BBC where I spent the majority of my, of my career for about 13 years on and off working in television and that too gave me an opportunity to work with some of the most creative minds in TV. I mean coming out of the UK and being a public service entity, the, uh, the, the drive to create experiences visual in the visual medium wasn't necessarily led by ratings alone or you know advertising revenue. So it really was this pool of incredible talent 
And again, I was on the business end of things, and that's where I've, I found myself fitting in, is able to support these amazing creators um, and help get these projects financed and distributed in the US. Um, and I did that for a number of years, always bouncing in, in, in between different departments. It seemed like every three or four years, I was looking for some kind of new challenge, um, whether it was to work with scripted content or work with animation content or documentary content. And eventually, it led me into working with interactive content. And as soon as I saw that in this digital landscape, there are so many new ways to tell stories and to connect with audiences, that to me, I just kind of got the bug. Um, and uh, after leaving the BBC, which I did about five years ago, I worked with a number of interactive uh, uh, media companies and also not-for-profits because another trend that I saw or that was meaningful to me was that content not only can be used for entertainment, but I also saw the real power that content can be have, have on impact. And it was, that was the kind of the, the path that led me to working with Games for Change because that organization not only um, uh, plays in the space of emerging platforms and media um, and connecting content and stories and interactive experience with, with audiences, but leverages that for positive impact. And so now, as, as the uh, president of Games for Change, I have the opportunity to lead this organization that really serves as a catalyst and hub for the power that games can have beyond entertainment. And we do that in a number of ways uh, through convening, through the Games for Change Festival every year. I'm so glad um, that that's something that, that you enjoy. Um, and I, I welcome uh, people to, to check it out. Um, but also to work with other entities who are interested in using games. We act as consultants. Again, I find myself acting as a creative partner to help bridge organizations who want to use games if positive impact. I find myself supporting game developers who are looking for funding and need to find new, new ways in which to, to realize those dreams. Um, so it's a very similar role that I play throughout my career, but on different platforms for different media and with different creators. So I, I thought we'd talk about, before we start talking about the kinds of um, people you're seeing coming by and the kinds of ideas, we th I thought we'd talk about risk a little bit. Th this is, these are risky careers where you have to sometimes take big swings. You have to attempt um, to convince people that you are a worthy partner when maybe you're not 100% sure that you understand the lay of the land. That maybe you could take us, each of you could take us back to a time when you took a big risk. What were some of the components of your thinking around that risk? And how did it, how did it pan out? There are, um, and, and perhaps, Shruti, you can admit, uh, agree with this, is leaving a corporate job uh, with that steady income <laughs> and you know, supposedly a career, yeah. Path, yeah, career <laughs> path yeah. um, into doing something on your own. And, and I did that myself five years ago. Um, and it was scary. Well, first it was invigorating and like I can take on the world. And then you know, reality set in and like, oh, you know, now I, I, need, I'm I, I set up my own client-based uh, consulting business. You know, and now I've got to keep, keep that chugging along. And, and that to me, that I remember that moment a couple of months in and went, wow, this is going to be really hard. But I, able to, I was able to <laughs> direct my own path. I mean, there I really was able to go after business and clients that I was interested in. I was able to re, um, reestablish myself or take risks within that environment um, in ways that I wouldn't have been able to do within a corporate culture. So I guess I can build upon that because I have taken <laughs> the biggest risk. But I feel like I, it's, it's kind of a constant because even in, when we're pitching ideas and talking about the type of stuff that we want to do, we're trying to come up with ways where we can risk losing somebody, but we want to make the stuff that matters. And that also means trying new things. And sometimes when you're working with brands that, you know, have, we're trying to get them to also approach things in a different way. So there's a constant risk factor um, in our approach, not for the sake of risk, but just for a new way of thinking. But definitely, I think after I left Nylon in October and having worked at these you know, great brands and companies and you know, getting calls from other places, and it was a time where I had to ask myself, where am, where am I at right now and where can I learn the most? And where will I be the most challenged and where can I grow the most? And the thing that I hadn't done yet was really focus on making stuff that really mattered to me in terms of the impact I wanted to see with the stories that we wanted to tell. But of course, this was not a venture I did by myself. It was with two amazing partners and a great team 
which I'm very privileged to have because we're a real partnership. And so we're, you know, when you're in it um, completely, it's very exciting. And actually, it's, uh, I just got called for um, an interesting job for a Marvel show. And I had to send an email. And this just happened last week. And it was interesting because I was supposed to go in for a meeting and I was looking at my resume. And then I sent the person an email saying, thank you so much for reaching out, but I have to focus on my own company right now. And that was a really interesting thing for me to do where having had like my paycheck every other week and taken that big risk, I was then really committed to this. And I was like, look, I have a, I have a team. We're working together and we're gonna do this as hard as we can, as best as we can and then, and, you know, and we'll work as hard t until we can't, and then we'll reevaluate. But it was a very interesting thing to say no to a possibly awesome opportunity. Yeah, I think, I think getting my degree here probably was one of the biggest risks I've taken uh, at this stage of my career. You know, being removed probably about uh, eight to ten years from college and to the idea of going back um, with a full-time job was, was pretty daunting, um, especially how I remembered college for the first time. Um, so, but I also felt as though it was necessary. Um, you know, in the entertainment field, it, it can be very fickle, um, and longevity isn't a, a, a term that's generally used in people's career. You generally hop around from, from job to job and, and, and try to figure out how, you, how long you can ride that wave. So I knew that I needed a contingency plan, and I felt as though the de degree in business was one that was going to go with me regardless of what field I was in. And so uh, once I finally made the decision to, to venture into that space, I knew that it would take a, a heightened level of focus to get it done. And, and thankfully, I was able to. And, and now I have that to kind of look back on and, and take that with me wherever I go. So let's talk about money a little bit, because um, we all want more of it or any of it. And if you're in business, in the media business, you want to figure out how to make money. And it seems like it's a moving target. So. What have you learned in the last few years about new ways of making money or what's coming down the pike, new, whether it's through new platforms, new partnerships? Do all you really need is a good lawyer to figure it all out? Or, or is there really room to invent um, new ways of generating revenue? Because it seems like people are really struggling. <laughs> I mean, for <laughs> yes, they are struggling. Um, but I'll say, you know, I think it's really about the creativity now. I think that the, the people who, who have the proprietary content are really winning in the space now. And there's a, there's a multitude of ways to monetize it. Um, I think the content ownership is very important right now. I mean, especially when it comes to music and entertainment. You know, some of the biggest gripes that the artists have are, and you read about it, you'll read about artists talking about how they get a gazillion plays on Spotify, but they only get a $30,000 check. And part of the reason is because that check is divvied up by the myriad of writers and producers and owners of masters and publishing. Um, and so really it's about owning it. And, and, and understanding and understanding the space as well. You know, I think you have to know what you're getting into before you get into it and really kind of do your homework before you before you jump into that to that field. But I think that the owners of content, great content, creative content are the ones that are really going to be able to kind of generate the revenue from it because everybody's looking for it. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I, let's say, walked away from another job opportunity was that we are developing our own ideas. And instead of going to work on somebody else's show, it'd be great to just focus on our own shows that we are shopping. Because then that's really how you, it, it is about holding on to that idea and not selling out. But you still have to be strategic about how to find a sustainable lifestyle as well. And so you have to be creative and maybe sometimes you'll take some things, really just work with your friends to figure it out while you're, you are kind of dogged and focused on what you really wake up for every day. Um, in, the, in the world of games, uh, I think there's, we're seeing kind of a, a rise of the independent game developer in, in ways that I think the film industry saw 
15, 20 years ago. And with the technology that's advancing, there are opportunities to act as your own publisher in games in a way that didn't exist 10 years ago, where you needed to go to a, um, a console partner, publisher, in order to release that. So now with platforms like iOS or an Android or Google Play or even Steam, where you can release a desktop games, you can become your own you know, master of, of distribution. And so there are more opportunities for the independent creator. I mean, it's still hard. I mean, you, there still are you know, thousands of games out there being released every day, and you, ha and you end up in a marketing conundrum of how to fund your marketing and to get noticed. But I think there are more opportunities there than there ever have been in the games industry. So let's talk about the kinds of talent that you're seeing coming through your offices or knocking on your doors. Um, what are the ideas that are getting your attention what are the skills that people have that are getting your attention? And where are people falling short? That's so many questions <laughs> in one. <laughs> um, so let's talk about people first before ideas. There's, there's a lot of people that want to work in the media business. And, um, and really, the people that work really hard, really persistently, really consistently, and very honestly are the people that we're most attracted to. And those are the traits we look for in, let's say, our, our interns and now some of our staff, because to work with integrity and authenticity is underrated, and that's definitely the type of person we want to be working with. Because those are also an element of the stories that we want to tell. So it has to be reflective in the people who are telling them. To that, um Communication skills are incredibly important, and passion, obviously, uh, for what you're doing. Uh, I'm working now in this interesting space of, yes, I'm working in the entertainment and games industry, but I'm also running a not-for-profit that does, isn't able to pay very well and really requires people to really feel like they want to, they're fully committed to what we're doing and believe in the mission. Um, so f for me, I don't think there's, there's not like a whole list of people who are game developers who have worked in the impact space before. We're kind of, you know, we're, we're bringing in people into the space who either um, have done it for a long time and worked in the commercial sector, but now really want to give back. And that's a, a, a really great place to be in your career if, if you're in that place. Or um, have some really strong skills that are transferable to what I'm doing. And I think that's the most underrated piece and what I look for, um, having being somebody who went from one end of, of uh, one type of medium into another, you know, I had to transfer and, and communicate the transferability of my skills into this space um, because I didn't, I wasn't coming at it as a game developer, nor was I coming at it as an executive of a not-for-profit. I just knew, I felt, and, and was able to convince those who believed in me that my skills were transferable, and I think that's, I think that's a really important communication opportunity yeah I would say um, a couple of things I think from a talent perspective it's important to understand how you're selling yourself to a uh, potential employer I think you really sort of curate that sales pitch to each interview that you go into I think understanding the company and 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 and, and the job description fully helps you. I, I've seen a lot of times where people come in and, and don't really have any sort of knowledge or understanding of what we do or what we're looking to do. When a lot of that, especially now with all that's going on in the media, um, with with Viacom, a lot of that stuff is is, is essentially public information. So doing your homework is important. And I think the other thing for us is really somebody who's going to be an ambassador of the culture, so to speak, for us. Because, you know, one of the strengths that I think a lot of people have is the ability to kind of go out there and sort of be the spokesperson for the brand, but also to kind of scout for us because we're always looking for talent, um, both internally, but both for, for, our, for our platforms as well. So, you know, is somebody going to go out and be able to go out and, and check out performing acts and to understand technology? You know, are you going to go be at the South by Southwest interactive portion and know what the next big wave is so that if it's something that we're looking to acquire, like we tried to do a couple of years ago with MySpace, that you're going to be able to tell us what makes sense and why it makes sense for us. I think that's essentially what we're looking for. Somebody who's going to be able to kind of have the ability to foreshadow into the future of, of technology and how technology and, and music intersect and to, to give us insight onto what decision making, um, d what decisions we should be making in that, in that space. Follow up on all of that. If, 
if I gave, if I waved a magic wand and made you in charge of all of MTV, which is clearly where you're going, what kind of, what kind of changes or decisions would you make right now, anticipating the future? Uh, I, I think one of the changes that I would make is, I think there's, I think that there's a, a tug of war, if you will, between generations. You know, I think millennials get a bad rap. Um, also, although some of them do exhibit the skills that uh, uh, people say about them, but um, but I think that, and that's natural. I believe. I believe that every gener there's always going to be a, a disconnect between generations. It's the way you did it versus the way somebody else does it, and who who's right. And I think that sometimes it's important for both sides to kind of take into account that I am talking to somebody younger, I am talking to somebody older, but ultimately we have one common goal, which is to succeed in, in our respective fields. And how do we get to that point? And so I think understanding each other better, um, I think I would probably like to see some of the executives be more of facilitators for our entry level and middle management uh, employees because those are the ones who are living and breathing the culture and then how do we allow those ideas to thrive and the, and the executives will be more facilitators of basically saying like we have the experience we have the know how you have a great idea it sounds crazy here's how we can curate to curate it to make it make good business sense that's great so why don't we just just run the table with the same question. You're in charge. You've got all the money you need. What, what it, tell me the elements you need to be the, the biggest in your industry. What do you see ahead and what would you do? I would really train people to become good managers and good leaders because that's how you encourage great creativity from the ground up. And it surprises me constantly how much bad management there is in these amazing, innovative, creative companies that represent some of the most inspired brands. And then you see sexism, you see ego, fear, like in insecurity essentially blind people when it comes to decision making. And it's so counterproductive to encouraging some of the best ideas from some young people to rise through the ranks. and. When people get treated like that, when they start moving on up, they start to treat other people with in that same way. And it's just this ripple effect. And it's and but even if you're a good manager, you may have a boss who's just a jerk. And it's just if only it, there was also like an upwards learning curve. Like it, where where leadership could learn from spirited, young, inspired interns about how to start a conversation and solve certain problems. That's exciting. I think that's also why there's so many tech startups because n there's like a need for new companies and new ideas, but old, older media companies can learn from, from rethinking how their managers get trained. So I would really want that if I was leading an organization, I would make sure everyone's trained in a way to encourage collaboration and creativity effectively. Incredibly inspiring answer because I think it really hits to it, and that's been the dream of these young technology companies. You, you know that Facebook was when when and Google were all very young, and one of the great disappointments that their diversity numbers, for example, are so low. It's really astonishing because that was supposed to be the new frontier where meritocracy was absolutely going to reign supreme, and it turned out to be just the same old way of doing business. I've seen that too, and having been part of a few startups um, that at, at that in that growth phase where they get a, they they reach a certain level of success and then bring in the experienced CEO to come in and really run it and really scale it. But when the when the when the reality is very often that's it is the old way of doing business and it doesn't and it, and, and I can see that happening. Right, and the creative, the creative spirit that got you there is the spirit that needs to be tamped down so you can report earnings on a quarterly basis and have very pretty pictures in your annual report, but you're not necessarily generating the big ideas. And that's also part of the risk. The bigger you get, the, the, the less likely an organization is systemically able to manage risk. And so one of the things that seems to be very clear for particular people working in this sector who are bringing the new ideas, who are bringing the content, who are bringing the marketing savvy, at least in their at least in potentially, is that this is, this is the very group of people who have an opportunity to impact the, um, the leadership orientation of a bigger organization. I, mean, I, I just have to say, I'm actually very also grateful for my 
bad bosses because then you learn how not to be. So that's also a good thing, but it still perpetuates. We should really start wine at these events because then all the bad boss stories would, would come <laughs> tumbling out. Dean, Dean, you've been so patient. <laughs> Not representative of the field. We just heard all this thing that I'm going to do with the Oscars and that industry, which is part of your industry as well. Has there, has there been progress? And what kind of advice? You know, we have a school that is a school, as you can see by, by just the, some of the folks here today. What are the challenges related to that? Has there been progress? And obviously, you guys have overcome some barriers. What's the present status of that? And what kind of advice do you give? Yeah, I think there's been some progress. I think there's, there's a long way to go. Um, I think that what happens in, in certain companies is that, you know, when you make it to a certain point uh, as a minority, um, generally there, there, there very well may be a limited amount of opportunity. And so you become very possessive about your space. And so the opportunity, the, the, the idea of bringing somebody else up along underneath you becomes a daunting task because it may make you obsolete. And so you're always playing defense. And I think that that's something that as an or, needs to happen in the organization so that there's plenty of opportunities for plenty of people so that you don't necessarily feel like I have to play keep away with this position. And so I think it, it has to happen from the top down. Um, I also think that for employees, it's important to kind of look at that and 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 understand that you need to sort of take a self-assessment and say well realistically what is my ceiling in this company or in this department and if it's very very low then where do i need to go where it can it'll be higher i think that you know especially if you have the skills um you need to take them where it's going to benefit you to the highest degree in the long run you know and i think that sometimes that may mean you know people talk about new york and, and big metropolitan cities it may mean going to somewhere else where your your talents are going to are going to be very utilized and you'll be able to thrive and then you come back to the big cities and 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 show them what they missed out on when they didn't give you those opportunities originally i i would say it's definitely there there's definitely a diversity issue in Hollywood, and um, and the number that we get thrown, at, we talk about a lot, is the four percent. Because in the last 15 years, if you look at some of the biggest movies ever made in Hollywood, only four percent were directed by fe by women directors, and most film school film programs have more women than men in their programs, and it's just about why are their careers not being sustained, and that's a but at the same time, it really is how do you create a network effect and encourage more women to also hire women and more guys to also encourage women as well. So, I mean, that's the gender bias. And there's definitely other biases as, as well that we have to overcome. But I, sh I, I would say it should never stop anyone. It should never prevent you from doing anything. It may, I wouldn't even necessarily say slow you down, but make you more aware of certain things that are trying to stop you, but you shouldn't ever let them stop you. Yeah, I would add to that. I would say it's probably also breaking breaking sort of the stigma that's attached to to certain minorities. I mean, you know, working at MTV, I never wanted to be the rap guy. You know, my my music taste is so broad and diverse. I've programmed everything from heavy metal to to alternative rock to EDM to pop music, and I think that that's sort of what needs to happen as well on, on the side of every individual is sort of creating, uh, well, knocking down sort of the stigma that's attached to, to certain people where it's like, you know what, I'm not just this person, I'm also this, I'm also that. So having a diversified portfolio in whatever space you're going into so that people understand like you're not, they're not your per the perception of you that they have may not be wh who you really are. I, I would just to add to that from a management perspective that the, the situation remains serious and the implications are profound. And they're profound for, for women and people of color um, who have, and there are studies that prove this, who wait longer for um, promotions or are overlooked for promotions, the opportunity costs in terms of their, their um, salaries and their savings and the experience that they have, that they're unable to tap into ex powerful networks because they're consistently overlooked, or they are overutilized as token examples. 
you know, trotted out on diversity day, to, and so you're, you're busy being the diversity person and, and represent, and you know, you're, you're in all the brochures that I, that I'm, I, that we have a diverse organization, but when your job becomes not your creative job and it becomes your job to represent from a diversity point of view, that's a real, that, that takes real time away from your development as a professional. And I'm anticipating that as um, smaller creative companies and smaller technology companies have wonderful, exciting exits and are uh, brought into bigger companies, they're going to run into these, these kinds of systemic um, uh, barriers and, and, and itch issues of bias. The good news is, and there is tremendous good news here, is that outside voices with real power and heft are amplifying these issues in really interesting ways. So in the last few years, I've seen an unprecedented number of big and medium-sized organizations take on the question of diversity and inclusion in some interesting ways, and we won't know whether it's going to work for a while because, you know, people. But I, I do think although it's unfortunate that, that we get there through the business case. You know, people with diver companies with diverse leadership teams have, get, have better, you know, clearer, clearer pathways to innovation and make more money. The business case is clear. It's, um, that's just the way business talks. The truth is that there's a profound moral case to make sure everyone has a good experience in work and is allowed to be their full selves there so that you can have the best experience and make the best products and, you know, and grow. So we'll, that's a mixed bag of it's tough out there, but there's reasons to be optimistic. And it will come from the top, but the only reason it will come from the top because it will come from outside. Power to the people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, like you said, with the lack of diversity sometimes in, 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 uh, in the United States, what about collaborations with uh, emerging industries and developing countries like Nollywood and Bollywood, uh, South Africa, you know, having had success with District 9 movie? Um, what about approaching, you know, outside? Why, why, why keep focusing on trying to knock down Hollywood and whatever, you know? And all these emerging industries out there with so much opportunity, why are uh, people from this country not focusing more on those emerging industries? I mean, it, I wish America would look at the rest of the world and pay attention to global issues as in the way that the rest of the world looks at, looks at itself. And I mean, I've worked on Bollywood movies and I'm very involved with the film business in India as well. And ultimately, um, I've at our company, a lot of the projects that we are doing are global, but it's interesting to see which American brands want to develop those global stories, and we have to also encourage it, which is what we're doing in, in terms of the ideas that we're saying these are important. But then they also are kind of like, well, those budgets are bigger because the cost goes up for production when you are telling those global stories, and then our primary audience is here, and can we get them to care about it? And my one of my partners, Ray um, developed a series for MTV called Rebel Music, which is on Netflix, and essentially it's about young people using art for social change in areas of conflict. So they went to Israel and Palestine and Mali and Egypt and India and all over, and it was really interesting that MTV actually encouraged a show like that and greenlit it. And that's exciting is when networks and those platforms that have an audience encourage global programming. But ultimately you have to uh, ask, where is the money coming from that allows you to tell that those stories and bring it here? Um, and how, and I mean, and I'm from India, I'm definitely a global citizen, I didn't grow up here. And th that's the type of stuff that I wanna see, but it's about getting my network of American friends and friends in general to care about those issues in the same way. Or to they can invest in Nigeria and, and uh, or in an emerging economy and have a good experience. We got involved in a very international project that we, we, we felt and hoped was going to you know, uh, break ground, and I think it, I think it has, and it was uh, based on uh, Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Rudun's book, Half the Sky, um, which is a beautiful book uh, around, about women in oppressive societies. And that, that project turned into a multimedia project, actually, uh, which consisted of a documentary made by Show of Force uh, on PBS. And we were tapped to make a series of games around these issues to reach audiences who wouldn't necessarily be a follower of Nicholas Kristof or watch PBS. Um, and it was interesting because the, the series of games that we made were funded through solely American 
funders, brands. Wasn't it the Department of Education? Didn't they give Department of money? Education gave some money. The, the National Endowment of the Arts, um, USAID, Intel, that's, Johnson & Johnson. That's so cool. Yeah. And I learned it, that at, at Games for Change last year. <laughs> yeah, it was a significant round of funders, and it was all, and it was a... Um, both uh, an opportunity to build awareness around these issues um, through a Facebook game that was made, but also I think was more really more, uh, the more interesting piece is that we created three games, uh, feature phone games, very simple games that were played by uh, the communities that were um, told in these in these stories. So they were used in the field in Kenya and India um, as ways of con uh, conveying information about prenatal health care and, and, and others. But the, 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 point, the point being is that we did stumble across a, an international story um, uh, and, a, and a movement that got, luckily, you know, got the attention from the American brands to support. Um, That's very yeah. cool. I played the Facebook game. It was fun. Any other questions? Uh, it's, yeah, it's kind of, yeah. I just want to know, because um, uh, uh, you guys are talking about how the industry is changing, and uh, I'm, I'm 25, and it's like, this is not news to me. Like, me growing up, I never once worked for anybody in the first place. Like, like, my, my idea is, like, I'm going to make some money, and like, I'm going to start a business, I make music. And I work with people in the industry, and I see people who are signed to Epic, and I, and I work with him, and he's stepped away from Epic to focus on his own company that he signed to Epic with. And he gets more attention doing it his way, because he feels like when he lived Epic, yeah, now they reach in this area, you gotta make this side of music. Well, he's like, no, you gotta make this side of music. And then now, the music that other was saying, or oh, someone's saying was bad, is music they're making now. The same thing with Future, like Future is the epic. And he, he used to go through Epic, but then he went to Chambers, people say, here, Chambers, we're gonna work to drop this, this way. And then go to Epic until after it happens. And then it drops, and then Epic is like, wow, like, people actually want to hear it that way. So I'm here because my mom is a, uh, He's a uh, LMI C, uh, C, C, anyway, whatever it was. Uh, so it's like, uh, would you agree now that uh, the better way to do things, because you know, you use it back in the day, especially music, you want to you want to hit the record label. Would you go there, knock on the door, give me a demo, oh, can you sign me? Would you now focus on the funding of, I have an album, I need PR, I need a way to push it across worldwide. It's a numbers game. Is that the better idea now that you can see going through the industry you got working? I would say yes and no, um, and here's why. And, and that's a dope yams hat, by the way. Um, very nice. Um, very nice. Yeah, you're pushing it. You're pushing it. <laughs> but I think I will say I think one thing is that yes, the labels have benefit. It depends, really. Like you look at certain artists, and they're more self-sufficient, and they can get things done. Um, every artist, their sound is going to be different. You know, for a pop artist, would I say go that route? Absolutely not. Pop artists, you have to you have to cast a huge net. You need the muscle and the resources of a major label. Um, for other artists who are more self sufficient and resourceful, maybe not. But I think there are always going to be benefits and, and, and deterrents to a major label. It really depends on what you're looking for and what your needs are. I think the good thing in your in your friend's case is that from he got the experience from the inside, so he knew what the inner workings were, and he took that with him. So that come that that value goes with him, even though he's not getting a paycheck, he's still getting value from that job. Um, so I think you you have to decide on what makes sense for you. If you can put together a legit team to do it on your own, it's a daunting task to do. But um, in the end, will you reap benefits a lot more than you would under a label? Sure. But to, to the other point, every label is not, is, is not the same. I think it's almost like a basketball team. You can have a mediocre team, and then a great coach comes in and changes, every, it changes the dynamic of the team. And sometimes it's being in the right system. Now, I will reserve uh, judgment on Epic because, you know, they, they, they're, they're still do, they have future and they have some, some notable artists. But, you know, there are artists who get dropped from one label and go to another label and thrive. They can tell you how many artists have been on labels that you didn't even know about because they never put them out. And now they're on the label and they're hugely successful. It just depends on the system on, at the end of the day. But I just want to add to just uh, being an artist. I always kind of ask young people who want to, so they say they want to be actors, and it, my, I ask them what their motivation is, because the struggle for an artist is real. It's real. <laughs> so it's not, you can't say, I want to be a singer, I want to be an actor, because I want to be famous, mm -hmm. because it's not going to work. And you have to not only think about that first album, you already have to think about, 
if I can make that fifth album, that seventh album, because you're committed to that struggle and that challenge of rediscovery and discovery in general and, and learning and growing with your community of friends, because it's not necessarily an isolated movement and it's about creating a group that you are also with because it can also be a very lonely struggle and the way you can get through it is with other artists. I want to make a quick map, but I want to make a quick map, because the dude I'm talking about, I don't know if you've heard of him, like Vinny Chase, like Cheers Club, Kid Art. I'm very familiar, yeah. Like say, that's my, that's my mentor, Vinny, mm. Vinny's my mentor. Like, I work with him every day, I write with him, and he's the one that's kind of schooling me, because at first I'm like, yo, like, you're trying to epic, like, when can you bring me by, like, put me in the booth, and I'm telling you, dude, like, we make more money without epic, because, like, when we get a check from epic, you said that they'll throw, throw money to the producers, throw money to this, but if we keep it in-house, it's the reason they got signed in the first place, because they didn't even need help. They already had kids shooting all the best videos. Right. They had a kid uh, producing all the music. So they were just like, they just packaged it for them. But once they got to the people that packaged it, mm -hmm. you cut epic for middlemen out, now that check is yours. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah, I mean, I think it's a valuable learning experience in the end where you realize you, you had the, the, the ability to do it on your own all, all along. So it, it, do, it does help you in the end. Like, you're not going to recoup the money that you know, the label spent on doing something that you could have did for a, for a fraction of the cost. But ultimately, you, you now you validate what you, what you, what you thought you, you were going to be able to do. So and again, I think it's a case by case thing where some labels, some artists definitely need the labels. I mean, you know, there'd probably be no Eminem, no Jay-Z, no, 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 Joe, no Justin Bieber. Um, without or oh, no Nickelback, my favorite. Um, <laughs> without the labels, so it's a mixed so, Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Canada dominates the music scene right now. It's crazy. Uh, oh yeah, DMB too. Yeah. So y you know, it just depends. You know. Uh, to echo on what you're saying, um, uh, young, you mentioned that there's a big generation gap between the old season uh, industry captains and the new uh, millennials. Uh, myself being birth in an age where it's more, um, we like to have more ownership over our direction. Um, being that you guys were part of a generation where you had to have a resume and a season resume to show, show the capacity uh, for your performance, um, you mentioned something about scouting and looking for uh, an ideal employee to scout uh, for you to be in the scenes. What about for the young developing executive who goes out there anyway and attracts uh, these personnel but doesn't necessarily want to work with them to be or um, for any of the panelists here, uh, are you open to working with young adults who develop um, their own initiative uh, to show uh, support in, in, in uh, your areas? Yeah, I'd say definitely. I mean, we, we, we do that now. We, we constantly have meetings with people to kind of see what they can bring to the table that we don't necessarily have. A lot of that is, is in marketing. I mean, who better to speak to the youth than the youth sometimes, right? So it's like you look at some of the biggest events at South By and they're done by these young upstart kids who just thought like we just want to do a great show and it turns out to manifest itself into you know getting sponsorships from toyota and, and all these other companies i think we th those are those conversations are happening sometimes i think the disconnect is is understanding that at the end of the day it's a mul it's a multi-billion dollar company and so those ideas need to be big and the structure needs to be in place so that we know that you're going to follow through on your end of the bargain I also think that um, at these bigger companies, there's a cycle of bringing everything in-house and then outsourcing everything. And you know, nothing is ever constant, right? If you're in, in a company long enough, you start seeing that cycle. So um, if you catch the wave where the, everything's gonna be outsourced and you don't have an inside, you know, inside ad department or a creative department or a marketing department or a PR department, I mean, the list goes on and there's a need for those kind of partnerships. So, um, you know, knocking on doors, what's true this year is not necessarily true the next. We're constantly working with new voices and filmmakers because it's more exciting for us. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we're developing and making ourselves because those are the stories we're aching to tell. But when we're meeting people that come and pitch us ideas and we'll come on as, as an exec producer or a producer, we, are, we also really have to do our, you know, really figure out, are they really absolutely committed to this idea? Because when they do get the funding, are they gonna follow through? Because it's our names and our reputations are resting on what they're saying. And so you have to really evaluate if they're that committed because 
um, sometimes having gone through a structural system and having that training, which is also a good thing to have. It's good to have an entrepreneurial spirit, but it's also sometimes a very important and necessary tool to understand how corporations work. Then you, you also know that you can, what is at risk if you don't follow through? So it's important to have that big picture understanding and how systems work. And just to follow up, Ellen uh, mentioned, um, you know, what risk, what were the big, uh, biggest risks that you guys decided to, uh, to make? And uh, for, for both you and um, uh, Susanna, uh, I'd like to know when you first started uh, venturing out on your own, how did you effectively create a package or service to sell to uh, clients? What was that process like? Um, I started while I was still there. I think that that was a, a strategic choice to start getting word out that that was happening. And you know, I think there's an old adage: it's always easier to get a job when you have a job. You know, and I do think that is true. Once you're out on your own, you're on your own. Um, uh, but uh, communicating and networking and taking risks and perhaps even willing to do certain work for a lesser value than you ultimately are going to charge in order to prove yourself and create those case studies. You know, I, I took a big cut for what I was making when I was at, at my last job at the BBC to some of the things that I was doing as a consultancy. But because I strategically, I wanted to try something new. And that was, it was almost like starting over, right? I had this whole track record doing television, but I wanted to work in games, like what? You know, so I had to um, take the risk and have someone else take a risk on me. And then that started to build and I started building reputation, you know, back up or sideways into where I, I am now. The conversation around fictionless came up when I had resigned from Condé Nast and we were starting the company about a year and a half ago but then I got pulled into VP roles which I decided to take and then in the meantime my partners were working on projects and I was kind of more advising or consulting in a way and then in October I joined my own company full time but ultimately the media business is a people business and it is completely based on the relationships you build for se years and a lot of our clients that we have and are con are going to have are based on are from relationships that we've already had and those are the, that's why i talk about reputation and even then when you work with young people and you have your brand and your stamp it has to be something where this is a fictionless project but there is a fictionless process and a way of working and we have to be very specific about what that represents because we've been working really hard at it. And so that's also how we grow and that's how we're able, to, how we are able to then attract other clients. And it's word of mouth. Sometimes we hear about get project because someone had a good experience and they want to approach this and they understand that this is our lens. And so they want to, and that's, that's a, these are good problems. I think we're just about out of time. I thought I would ask the panelists to end on a philosophical or optimistic note. If there was one gift they could give you or one thing that they would invite you to work on or read or master that would help you look through the world with a creative, commercial, and brilliant lens, what would it be? I wish someone was telling me that <laughs> answer. Um, I love animation, and I love how I felt when I watched animated movies as a kid, and I love the way I watch animation now. And there's a nostalgia for it, and it's not just for kids. And so one of the best things that I saw recently, and this was when I was at it, this is a kind of random story, one of the highlights of my year last year was when I was at dinner party with a group of friends, there's just 10 people, but I was seated across from Wes Anderson, who's an amazing filmmaker who I'm a big fan of, and I was trying really hard to be cool <laughs> and like relax, and not freak out. And we were just talking about animation, and he said, you have to watch this movie called Only Yesterday, which was a Studio Ghibli movie that came out many, many years ago. and. I then had a movie that opened this year with James Franco called Yosemite at the IFC and it just so happened that that week the IFC had a Studio Ghibli showcase and they were showing all these amazing old Japanese anime and animation movies and there was my movie poster Aww. 
with James Franco, and right next to it was Only Yesterday. Aww. And that was a really amazing moment, and it was definitely a movie that I saw recently that is just stood the test of time. I guess what I would say is there's no prescribed path. You know, even if you think you know it, even if you're going to lay it out and plan it, just to be open to let new things come in and don't and not direct, feel so, I mean, stubborn, I guess is the best way I can say it, or just, or um, uh, there's a difference between holding true to your ideals and what you want to do and then not, and then not being open to other things that can, may come through. Um, and this may not, you know, in, in the world of startups where you hear conflicting direction of, you know, stay true to your vision. No, you should pivot, you know, you know, <laughs> you, you kind of can get confused <laughs> at what the directions are. Um, but I do think that you have to remain open. I just started doing yoga again after many years of not doing yoga. I do think it's really changed my attitude <laughs> in terms of being really open. Um, but it's true. But but it is. It's just with listening to what's going on around you and being open to opportunities. Um, and it's easier to do that when you are on your own. But even if you are in, a, in an organization, um, just, um, just, just keeping your eyes out there and being willing to take chances and try things. I guess I never really gave a piece of advice to my anecdote, <laughs> but <laughs> 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 so uh, I will just add it here, and and it goes: just enjoy your inner childlike spirit and keep that as you're creating things. That was worth the wait. There we go. <laughs> So I'll go in reverse. I'll, I'll, I'll give the piece of advice and then I'll give the anecdote. How about that? Um, Dame Dash said it in a middle rant um, recently, but it was so profound. Um, he said, hustle for your last name, not your first name. And I see the gentleman here with his son and, and, and I have a, a young son at home. And it's important to understand what you're doing, why you're doing it and who you're doing it for. Um, and so there's this book that I read, and it's called the 10x rule. And so basically, the 10x rule is basically you need to do everything 10 times as intense and as hard as you would normally do it. And there's this paragraph in the book that goes into detail as to why you need to do that, and it needs to happen all the time. And basically, it says, you know, the average age for a man is something like 74, 75. So if you're, you know, 36, 37. Um, you have something like 2,500 Wednesdays, 2,500 two Thursdays, 2,500 Fridays to live. So at that point, you've essentially lived out half of your Wednesdays. And, the, and it was the, literally the same age that it was, was the same age I was when I read the book. And so when you realize how valuable time is, you start to appreciate time and you start to be more responsible with your time. And so I would say be responsible with your time. Like know what you're doing and, what, and doing it for the right reasons and, and not be frivolous with your time. That's beautiful. Thank you to the panel. Thank you to everyone who showed up. We've got a wonderful reception. Namaste, everybody. <laughs>